On the first night before the first day of fasting, we spoke of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he says that you are, O oh man, O oh people, you are being overshaded, right? You are in the increasing shade of the approach of a tremendous month. Shahrun, Adimun, Mubarakun, a blessed month, right? In it is a night, and so on. And part of that hadith was that he said, Awalahu Rahma. The first of it is compassion. Al Satahu Maghfira. The middle of it is forgiveness. Wa akhirahu itkun minanar. Being set free like a slave that may even be chained, right, to keep them in captivity, right, being set free from the fire. Allahumma ja'alna min awwalihim wa awsatihim wa akhirihim. It is not a difficult thing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include us this month among the people who are set free from the fire. It's not hard for Allah to do, right, subhanAllah. Takes nothing, he loses nothing by it. And he's generous, and he's afuun, and he's kareem, right? Subhanallah. So we ask him to count us in that group, inshallah. So we have 30 days of fasting. Three sets of ten. The first of it is rahmah, compassion. But then the question becomes, how is a month compassion? If you stop, sometimes if we stop, it's not, sometimes it's not good to stop and analyze things. It's like walking on a, like a high precipice or even a tightrope and they say, don't look down. You're doing fine and see you look down and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh. You, all of a sudden you were standing firm, but now you somehow can't stand firm anymore. So sometimes uh, if you stop and you analyze something, you find that there's something to think about here. How can a month be Rahmah? But I think that we all have answers. Right? Can you all think of ways that Ramadan is a Rahmah? No? The wiping of the slate. The wiping of the slate. Well, that would be the middle that is forgiveness, right? I suppose. Anybody else? Some really, really obvious ones. What's that? Like <coughs> chaining the shaitan. Okay, mashallah, chaining the shaitan, right? I know that that must be a rahmah, but then for me it means that all of the, you know, not the greatest inclinations that I might have is just me, and I can't blame it on the shaitan, right? But that's definitely a rahmah. What about the increase of rewards? We all know things that we can put our finger on that are a special blessing uh, for Ramadan. SubhanAllah. Yesterday we buried Hajj Musa uh, Rashid, uh, pillar of the open Muslim community, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. And everyone was saying, Alhamdulillah, he got to see one more Ramadan. But he wasn't fasting. Right? We don't usually speak about the fact. We have, you know, it's common that people are going to have medical conditions. People have medicine they have to take, right? And there is a way to deal with that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for these things, right? And it's nobody's business, right? But obviously, if the brother is, you know, barely conscious uh, during his last days, Right? He's not necessarily going to be fasting. He's not going to be saying all types of extra prayers. And we know that it is from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you create habits for yourself and norms for yourself, that it's my norm when I'm healthy and in residence at home that I pray this sunnah and this sunnah and I do this and I do this so that when I get sick, I continue to have the reward for that. So all of that is sealed for Hajj Musa, okay? Uh, otherwise, you know, we don't talk about these things, but this is something obvious. But here, for the sake of, of, uh, 
of exploring this idea, Alhamdulillah, he got to see another Ramadan, but he wasn't physically participating in Ramadan. He was conscious of Ramadan, he knew that Ramadan was coming, right? Uh, and it's a rahmah. There has to be something more to the specialness of this month than just the physical actions that we would engage in, which are at the heart and the essence of this month, and I don't mean to discount them at all. Right? And we talked about how if you do an, uh, a voluntary act in this month, it's as if you've done 70 obligatory acts in the reward and the jaza' that you get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do one of your obligatory acts that you're supposed to do anyway, Right? They say, don't reward your children if they do what they already know they're supposed to do. Sometimes his parents were so desperate, oh, he was polite, he sat up straight, he didn't have his hands in his pockets, right? SubhanAllah, we got to give him something, right? He, he passed his exams, oh no, right? And they say, no, don't do that, right? Don't reward them for things that they're supposed to do anyway, right? You're not supposed to do that for your employees either. But sometimes... Right? I remember when I worked in the Gulf, right? If they just like did their job with like Edna degree of competence, we were talking about, you know, all types of increases and this, that, and the other, because we were so excited. They just did, you know, the basics according to um, the job specification, right? But subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that reward, right? You do one obligatory act, subhanAllah. Uh, it has this immense reward, right? As if it was 70 obligatory acts, right? Done outside of Ramadan. So that is there. But what else do we know about being in Ramadan, right? Once that moon flips from the new moon, which is black, right? To your first sliver of crescent, you are now in an envelope of time that is unlike any other time during the year. There is a special barakat. The, uh, the economy of rewards changes. Right? Something happens to the devils and the shayateen and the temptations. And when you are in tune with the expectation and anticipation of Ramadan, you can feel it in the air in your homes, in the masajid. That night that we were together on the first night before the first day of fasting, you could feel it in the masjid. It was electric. And that's part of that atmosphere. We spoke about the fact that the gates of the heavens are thrown open, never to be closed until after the end of the month. We already know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> descends to the lowest heaven every night of the year to ask, is there someone calling that I could answer? Is there someone asking forgiveness that I can forgive? But we stand under this sky that is not the sky of any other year, right? You stand under the exposed Jannah. And for that, this moment, no matter what your particular situation. And for those among us who do have medicine that they have to take, that's not easy, right? Some of the early Muslims said, uh, young man, do all of your sunnahs, right? Those enhancements from the way of the Prophet والسلام, when you're healthy and still young enough to do it, because you don't want to be the person who on top of the sorrow that they might feel that they're no longer able to pray in the way that mirrors the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you don't want to add to that the regret of if only I had been doing it back then, if only I had learned the shama'il of the Prophet والسلام, and the finer sunan of the way he did things, because the reason why we invoke 
these details of our fiqh is because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is witnessing us. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking to us. Allahumma ufirli wa lana fi ma tara min ahwalina allati la tadhiqu bi mu'minin bika ya arhamar rahimin. We know that Allah is seeing us and what we want is that when He sees us in our ibadat, He sees the hay'a, the form of His beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the whole point of the fiqh, is to be in alignment, in harmony with the way of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. The first of it is mercy. The first of it is compassion. In one of the ahadith of the Prophet والسلام, he says that Allah has 100 portions of mercy. He has withheld 99 of those portions that he keeps with himself and saves up for the day of judgment when the people, his people, are going to need it more than any other moment in their life. And we ask Allah that we meet and encounter His mercy on the inevitable day of judgment. Ya Arhamur Rahimeen, under His throne, with the, shuf, shuf, the shifa'ah of your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one portion He sends down into the world. And by this one portion, the mother horse that we call a mare in, in English, lifts her hoof, right, in the stable or wherever it is that they are, they are, out of fear of potentially injuring her foal, right, the baby horse, right, from that subtlety of that tie between the mother and the child, and whenever you see that in your wife, in your mother, right, in uh, someone from your family, that tenderness that all of a sudden shakes off the exhaustion, shakes off the fatigue, and she's fatigued and she's exhausted, huh? no doubt. It's not like she's not, but she has that tenderness that keeps her going, subhanAllah. That is from that portion of Rahman. Wa ma arsanaka. إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we've not sent you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, except as a mercy huh, to the world. By it, right? Huh? The mother horse lifts up her, her hoof, right, out of fear of harming her foal. In the Qur'an, right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هُوَ الَّذِي يُرْسِلُ الرِّيَاحَ he is the one who sends the winds before the coming of his mercy. What are these winds? We talked on that, uh, it was a Friday night, wasn't it? Right? We talked on that Friday night huh? of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having these breezes that he sends, that he sends out, right? And these are the opportunities to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the understanding of this <laughs> verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the wind to bring the rain clouds out until they come out over a barren land? And what is this barren land that's been stricken by drought? And what happens to the earth, right? The, the grass and the foliage and the vegetation turns yellow and brown and breaks, okay? The earth will crack because there's no water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it a dead earth. He's the one who sends the winds which carry the clouds heavily laden with rainwater before his rahmah. Allah has different types of rahmah. Literally in this verse, what is that Rahmah? Does anybody know? The literal meaning of Rahmah in that verse, which is true. Which Allah intends in the verse, the outward form of the, of the verse is the rain. Okay? 
And in another verse, and he sends down the rain upon a dead earth, and it comes back to life and blossoms and flourishes. And just like the earth might go dry, we have dry moments. Each of us is probably here today because of moments that we have experienced in our worship and devotion and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which we were moved by the divine presence. In which perhaps one person is moved to tears, another person might shudder, another person might be electrified. And you tasted a nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the opposite of those dry moments. Subhanallah. But your effort, and here we are in Ramadan, and we have easy days, mashallah. Allah make lots of easy days for us. Don't wish to meet the enemy on the field of battle. We have easy days, and we ask Allah for easy days, but some days are hard, some days are rough, and it is your perseverance and resolve huh? in those rough and dry times when you aren't feeling the good vibrations of the nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that saves up a receipt, a capital in your account that one day, one moment, one night, according to an agenda that Allah chooses, that account just opens floodgates and rushes forth. And part of that is the fact that you carried on during the dry spells, during the hard days. Uh, but sometimes it gets worse. Hearts get dry and hearts get hard. Uh, and what happens when you get uh, this hardening of the heart? You need a physician. You need a tabib. And who's the greatest tabib? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this rain comes. And what does it do to the earth when it comes down? It makes it reverberate. It does that. What rabat? Rabat from raba. Right? To grow, to blossom, to flourish when that rain comes down. So there is rain and there is rain. And when we turn to that sky on the nights of Ramadan and we raise our hands and we stand in prayer, hoping in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are we looking for? That that rain comes down. But it's not the physical rain that causes the mountains to turn green and the vegetation to flourish huh? and our homegrown vegetables and fruits to be in the marketplace and healthy and wholesome, but hearts to flourish and minds to flourish and souls huh, to become healthy and strong. All of this is in Ramadan. SubhanAllah. So we seek that this rain come down and that is for everyone. So there is the solace even for the person who wishes that they were able to fast, but for some reason, maybe for a medication that they have to take, or an injury, or some procedure that they have to recover from, right? Or maybe even the sister, right? Who it's that time and she actually doesn't see it as a break and sort of like recuperating strength, but she misses being able to be with everybody else, right? During those days. This is uh, the solace, right, for that person. That there's so much happening in Ramadan in addition to and surrounding the ibadat that we bring because of the specialness of Ramadan. Uh, Ibn Abbas said that there was no one more generous than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was even more generous in Ramadan. And on the nights, at the end of Ramadan, when Jibreel alayhi salam would come to him to review the Qur'an, he was more generous than a breeze released out over the surface of the earth. The Arab poets 
even in the early period of Islam, there are many Islamic uh, qasidas and, and poems where they're speaking to the wind, to the breeze, right? If you're in Sham, if you're in uh, uh, Syria, and a breeze comes from the south, right? What's south of Syria? For a while in Midan, I lived in a house right on the old Hijaz railway, right? That went from Damascus all the way to Medina to Munawar. Doesn't anymore, right? But the tracks are still there, okay? Uh, and they go, sometimes, you know, they would go, like every few years, they try to revive it. It goes out to a few villages outside the city and stuff like that. But of course, you know, there's not a great deal of money involved, so it would never last. But uh, subhanallah. Just south of Sham is Medina. So if they would get a breeze, and here's the subtlety of their sense, their hiss, and their thaqafa, right, of deen. If a breeze came from the south, they would imagine that this breeze has come all the way from Medina, maybe even carrying news from the beloved that their heart is attached to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they would speak to that breeze. Ya Nusaymat al Khuzami, Balligi Taha Salami, Balligi An Gharami, right? Haythu An Husabrufani. O gentle breeze from the direction of the tribe of Khuzama who actually during the seerah were allies of the Prophet والسلام, even when they were not Muslim. They were free, constantly working with non-Muslims who were actually working with them to achieve the goals of the Medinan community. At the Feth al-Makkah, right? Their guides getting down there were from Khuzama or better, right? They had people from Khuzama helping them out. Or when they went to Hudaybiyah. Right? They had guides who were non-Muslim from Khuzama that knew the honesty, the siddiq, the honesty, and the amana, the trustworthiness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they weren't blinded by prejudice. They weren't blinded by arrogance. And so, regardless of what the religion is, this is the person that we want to be allied with and working with. Right? And of course, eventually, Khuzama, they all become Muslim anyway. So. So they spoke, they said, O oh, gentle breeze from the direction of the tribe of Khuzama, huh? bring, send the news back to Taha, right? Of my love for him, and that I have no patience left to be separated. We have these breezes, these opportunities in this month, which is another part of the mercy of this month. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about His own mercy, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَسَأَكْتُبُهَا لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِنَا يُؤْمِنُونَ And my Mercy encompasses all things. And in one of his ad'iya, Imam al-Ghazali would say, and I'm a thing. You said that your mercy encompasses all things. Well, that's good news, because I'm a thing. So, if that's all you amount to, is just something. But then it gets encompassed by the rahmah of Allah. SubhanAllah, Fustuwa Rabbil Kaaba. What, what surmounts that? What is bigger than that? What achievement is greater than that? So then tell me, instruct me, teach me. What are the means to get there? That is a driver. That is a maqsid. That is an informing goal and objective that helps us to understand our path forward as a community. This is cartography. If you want to get somewhere, right, you have to have a map to get there. But then you have to have map reading skills as well, right? MashaAllah, we can make all types of metaphors for GPS, 
But when it gets down to it, we can't afford to just be the consumers of the GPS equipment. We have to understand how these compasses work. We have to understand map reading, and the people who lead us have to understand the map of where we need to get to, and to be able to then use, have access to a compass, right? Because you have huh, the stars, those fixed points of light in the sky above us that no matter how rough the seas get, the sky stays still. But we're so busy looking at one wave after another wave. How many people have had to travel before out on the open ocean? At some point in your life, right? Nobody crossed the channel from France to London, right, before the tunnel, right? Uh, or some other rough sea. You know what it's like, right? You come up and the wave goes like this and you're in the middle of the ocean and what, however big the craft you're on, it just drops down and descends into this valley. And the other side is coming up, you can't even see the horizon. You're so consumed with, am I gonna make it through this wilderness, this forest of mountains, right? That I'm dropping off one cliff and then rolling up another and what's gonna become of me? We never stop to look up and see that the stars are the same. They're there to guide you. Um, we're so consumed by the tragedies and crises and issues and fears that grip us. We don't realize that the law is unchanging. He's still there and his principles guide us, particularly his universals. Huh? So, you need to be able to read those stars to navigate to safe harbor. But you read the stars, you have to have sometimes equipment, right? Because you need to translate what you're reading through the astrolabe or the sextant, huh? And then you need a valid, legitimate map. It's based on reality. Our definition of knowledge for 1,000 years is for us, knowledge is a decisive judgment that we take in a case that is in accordance with reality, that is in alignment with reality, in accordance with evidence. That has to be the map. Those are the conditions of the map. But then you need the compass to chart the right course, because does anybody here ever sail? Has anybody ever here sailed? Right? I got my sailing license when I was like 14 years old. Right? I'm sure I've forgotten everything. It's been a million years since I ever went out, but I used to be able to sail our, 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 uh, our sailboat by myself. It wasn't giant, it was 22 feet, right? but it's supposed to be sailed by two people. Right? Uh, so, if you ever sailed, you know that a sailing vessel doesn't go straight to its de destination. That's pretty much next to impossible unless you just get this incredible breeze that happens to be wind that's going in that perfect direction. But usually the, the wind is never going in the direction that you're trying to get. You have to hook it, right? And you're going this way to get there. So the, the course is not always the shortest distance between two points, right? That works in some of our sciences, but in other aspects of life, the shortest distance between two points is gonna get a lot of people killed, or hurt, or throw babies out with bath waters with ayyadu billah. But it's wisdom, sometimes common sense, sometimes an awareness of the ultimate metaphysics of the cosmology of the universe, right? That tells us how to navigate in this way, subhanAllah, and it's rarely ever. I'll tell you one thing, one thing that should be taken to heart, and I'm very serious about this, one of the key things that differentiates you from the beasts of the earth, 
cows that graze all day and never put their heads up to look at the sky. All other types of animals is that human beings can choose to live according to principles. And those principles that they live by often require sacrifice to stand by. And that is one of the key and most important things that differentiates you from animals, particularly predatory animals, other types of nasty beasts. And to live a life according to principles means not always taking the shortest distance between two points. Because those principles that make you a human being and allow you to fulfill your identity, allow you to be who you were created to be, and that person that you will regret, inshallah, not having been when you're on your deathbed, huh, is not the shortest distance between two points. That's the bottom line. But we're wooed in this world, especially as we move further and further from the most virtuous generations. What are the best generations? The best generation is the generation right before my generation. And it only gets better going backwards. Right? So the most superior is the time of the Prophet والسلام, and then his companions and their students. And then the students who learn from the students of the companions. Why? Because they're warithit al anbiya, they're carrying this flame, this torch, somewhat similar to an Olympic torch. From one generation, they're passing it on. And each preceding generation superior in their abilities to both. Uh, carry that torch and understand what it means to carry that torch until you have those dry huh, centuries, those dry generations. Someone who might carry a torch but not understand exactly why. You know, Rubba, Hamiri Fiqhin Ila Menhua Nam Al Aminhu. Right? Maybe someone who carries understanding of deen, carries it to someone who will understand it better than the one who carried it. I know that narration, and I know what it means, theoretically. Because all I ever saw was that the generations that came before me understood better than me. Right? Understood better than me. But, you know, I ran into places and students and met individuals who were missing an understanding. No. SubhanAllah. But there are always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps alive in the face of the earth those who keep this reality alive, right? Your uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يزال طائفة لا تزال طائفة من أمتي قائمين على الحق Right? There will not cease to be a group from my ummah that stand up for truth. And part of truth is haqiqa, reality. They understand the big picture. They understand, right, what they're being told by those stars in the sky of guidance that transcends our pettiness, transcend our crises, transcend the crisis of the moment, the fitna of this week, this month, this year, and can look beyond the trends, look beyond the fashions that will never gain traction, huh? and see the way forward. Right? They see the haqiqa and they stand up for the haq. La yadurruhum men khadalahum wa la men khadalahum. Right? They will not be harmed by those who, huh, who forsake them. 
until the command of Allah comes, until the end of time comes, and they are as they had always been. So we need to be able to read those skies and have a map to help us understand where we're going. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that huh, my mercy embraces all things, therefore I shall ordain it for those who fear Allah and pay the zakat and those who believe in our signs. Our verses are our signs. Here is Ramadan. What happens in Ramadan? We celebrate the verses amid the signs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows literally the effects of his names and attributes in our world. Razik, right? Huh? al wadud the one who has love. Right? The one who shows love. When anyone shows love to another, when one believer shows love for his brother, or she shows some type of love and care and concern for her sister, if you see that when it happens, know that there were two people and things that transpired between them, but what you saw was a tajalli of al wudud they couldn't achieve those sifat between them, except that they were reflecting sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Oh Allah, show me yourself. Right? Well, I will show myself to the mountain, and if the mountain continues to stand, then maybe you will see me in this life. <laughs> Allahumma. جعلنا من الذين ينظرون إلى وجهك الكريم يا أرحم الراحمين وجوهنا ناظرة في جنتك الفردوس الأعلى آمين. Now, what you've seen is a tajalli of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here at Wudud. Subhanallah. So, we have signs that we witness. We have signs, the Qur'an itself that is revealed in this month is one of those tajalliyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. His communication, his eternal communication to his creation. He didn't, as the deist wants to say, create the watch, wind it up and walk away. Right? and go to the Bahamas, right, to retire, right? SubhanAllah, no, he's involved in every moment, but we're not always sensitive to the aspects of his involvement, but there's the learning and the knowledge again. The more we know and understand the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with intimacy, the more that prepares us and enables us to see the manifestations, the tajalliyat of the majesty and the jamal, the beauty of those sifat and asma in every horizon. Right? So we will show them our signs on the horizons and in their very selves until it becomes clear to them that this is the truth. We think of one horizon, but the horizon is 360 degrees. Right? It's not one horizon. We think of one horizon, but Every point where your eye reaches its limit in its vision is a horizon, right? Anything that you look upon with your eye is creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and at the very least, it is a tajalli. If you can see it if, with your basira, with your insights of his name al-Khaliq, at the very least, al qadir and it's the way he wants it to be, Al-Murid, Al-Muqaddir, Al-Muqtadir, Al-Qadir, right, according to his measure, right, if you see it, and everything becomes a horizon, and Allah is showing you those signs that you can read, 
if you're sensitive to that language, right? If you're sensitive to understanding, right? That kullu yawmin huwa fi right? And one of the early Muslims asked one of the scholars of the tabi'i, and so what shatan is he on today? Right? Kullu yawmin. Yawm is what? It's a portion of time. Right? Sa'a is what? In the seerah and the ahadith of the Prophet Sa'a is not 60 minutes. Right? It's kind of like a few. How many is a few? Well, you know, three, you got a few. But do we say that's written in stone? Sa'a is a portion. Right? It's understood by the urf of the people of a particular region, but it's a portion of time. And yom then cannot be muhaddad at 24 hours. So there are leeway. We're calculating, we measure it by 24 hours today. That doesn't change. But we see that there is a potential for leeway. And there is a truth in our aqidah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even, not only create the dunya, but He's sustaining it, yamudduhu, biwujudihi, with its existence in every single moment. And if Allah were to withdraw that imdad, that supply chain of support, it would go black with nothingness. And it always wants to return to its origin, which is non-existence, which is true darkness, even darker than the darkness of when there is no physical light shining, of nothingness. So, kulla yawmin huwa fi shatn, that is legitimately understood that yes, every day, but also every hour, Every moment, every second, every millisecond, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is busy. Huh? And He does not get tired. He does not get exhausted or fatigued. Right? That's what Ayatul Kursi is about. We like to read Ayatul Kursi. Don't forget, Ayatul Kursi is talking to you. And there's things in there that are part of that kharita, that map that are part of that compass, that sextant, that enable you, right, to be able to read those stars and then translate that into an operating agenda that is bigger than the crisis of this week or this year. Allah help us through the crisis of this year. To get through it safely, us and our families, physically, but also emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, we have an understanding if any of us are a member of a family or a member of a community. We know how to put on airs and smile and everything's good, but we know what crisis is. And we also see how people can become damaged, not just in their physical body. And we have seen people who may become damaged in their physical body, but internally, in their heart, in their psyche, in their mind, in their soul, subhanAllah, right? They're fit as a fiddle, sound as can be. And we see others where everything seems to be right. MashaAllah might even be super handsome, right? Have all types of things going for them as it would appear, but they're scarred, they're damaged. Right? Some people heal well from their scars and other people get right that knotted up scar tissue. And sometimes the scar tissue causes problems, physical problems. They might even have to have it surgically addressed. You know, it's not just a lump in the flesh where the scar was, where that wound was, right? But it's actually causing other physical problems and has to be addressed by a surgeon. So we ask Allah to get us safely, right, on the inside and the outside, right, to safe harbor, to enable us with the ability to do that, right, subhanAllah. 
These are some thoughts on the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're talking about the Rahmah, so, I mean, even these pages that we're never going to get to is like nothing compared to the vast, vast, deep, and shoreless ocean of the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a Rahmah, right? It's an ocean. It rains from the sky, it's an ocean above you, it's an ocean below you. Right? The heavens and eternity. Jannah is eternal and Jannah has already been built. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded that it will never come to an end. No end. That is an ocean without shore, but we are accustomed to looking at oceans below us. Right? Hopefully not around us and like that. But here, with the eternal Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The wellspring of Rahmah. From it flows the Kawthar. From it is the pool of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam that if you get there, you drink a sip. After that, you are never thirsty again. And you become, the mouth gets dry. Huh? And sometimes it's even hard to talk. Huh? Uh, during the days of Ramadan, just remember that the people who make it through this get to a pool, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that was built for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Don't tell me he's a man like other men. He just happened to be the one that Allah saw on that day and chose him. There's a start to the knowledge of Allah, or the knowledge of Allah is eternal. Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam is mukhtar, khatim al-anbiya, before the world was ever created. Can Allah wa la shay'a ghayru? Allah was and there was nothing with him. But his knowledge has no start. That Jannah is eternal. This earth is finite. So the idea of an ocean, flip it up, and you have an ocean open above you in Ramadan. SubhanAllah. And you stand under it every single night. And it's there and it's deeper and more expansive than any ocean of this planet. If you just had the sensitivity huh, to see it. And wallahi, all of this is in harmony and in keeping with and in alignment with the understanding that has come to us from this revelation that is revealed on the night of power in Ramadan, and the teachings of the Prophet والسلام, which were his way. And let's look at this generosity, and let's look at this Rahmah, and in closing, we hope in this Rahmah, but we're also responsible. And this is the Amana that binds us when we claim to believe in and testify that we follow the Prophet who was sent for no other reason than Rahmah. And this Amana is that not only do we pursue and hope in the Rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we are responsible because the Prophet والسلام, is not walking on the face of this dunya with us here. Huh? We are responsible to carry on that rahmah and to make sure that our neighbors and our fellow citizens know that this is the month of rahmah. We can go out and affect it and try to force it with the kalifin, right? But Allah will choose people, right? That will carry this rahmah to others. It's inevitable. And Things don't look good in this country right now. Right? We can be as optimistic as we want, but you know the world is changing and time is changing. Um, you know, we. I mean, personally, I love this country. This is my country. This is my land. I look at those mountains out there, and they're a delight to me, and that's home for me. Right? I was born in California, but I grew up in the Northeast. Right? So, part of me like wishes for the different colored leaves of the Northeast and fall and all that, but it's beautiful. Hmm? 
But even despite the fact that things don't look so good, look at the history of this deed in this country. This is something special about this land. SubhanAllah. 400 years ago, believers in the worst horror and terror that you can imagine, trying as hard as they might, huh? not to let uh, the Qur'an go. With every opportunity trying to write it out, with any utensils that they can get, and it's illegal for them to do that. It's illegal for slaves to learn how to read. But some of these huh, brothers and sisters were graduates of Madaris, of Madrasas, and they're trying to keep this deen alive. Some historians say you can go further back than that. Something strange, right, is going on here. You know, we don't see in a lot of other countries, a lot of other places, where there are large Muslim populations, right? No matter how dumb Muslims act, people still come out and try to help them. It scares me to death, right? We're constantly surprised, but it's like, we do not deserve this, right? We do not deserve this. Let's be the people who deserve that. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Barakallahu feekum wa ahsan Allah ilaykum. Allah give you all a wonderful Ramadan. We're at day eight. We're almost to the end of the first ten, right? Then we move into the second ten. Wa awsatuhu, huh? Maghfirah. Forgiveness. I could use some of that. Allah ibarak feekum wa ahsan ilaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ya Rabbana min fadlika ilman wa ikhlasan wa hilma In Surah Al-Hadid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Sabiqu ila maghfiratim min rabbikum وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ أُعِدَّتْ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ذَلِكَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ يُتِّيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ Race with one another to forgiveness from your Lord. In the verse, إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ To a forgiveness from your Lord. MashaAllah. There's a special umum in the, a special general application to the fact that uh, an indefinite uh, use of maghfira, forgiveness, right? The forgiveness, a forgiveness, right? A forgiveness that can encompass everything. And the hadith that we've been looking at from the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, you have been overshaded. So now we're supposed to race to a forgiveness. You've been overshaded. There's so much alliteration in the Arabic language. The Arabic language is constantly moving in three, maybe even five dimensions, right? Uh, once you sort of move into uh, an understanding of it, race to a forgiveness. SubhanAllah. So in the use of this indefinite uh, form, there is a generality and all-encompassing, a forgiveness for all of those things that some particular individual may need a forgiveness from. But sometimes, right, often, we'll go, before we go to sometimes, we'll start with often. Often we expect that the definite article, the, is what makes something great. Not a mosque, the mosque, right? But sometimes when there's already an understanding that there's a greatness or an importance of a thing and then we go for indefinite, that means that it's like priceless. So some, there are things that are expensive, 
and there's a price tag on it. But there are things that, right? You go to the nice restaurants, there's no prices next to the items on the menu, right? Because if you have to ask about the price, you don't really belong in this restaurant, right? But there's a special malfira in Ramadan. So in this hadith, we've been looking at from the Prophet والسلام, he describes the month as the first of it is Rahma, right? And that was our subject matter last time we met. And the middle of it is Maghfirah, forgiveness, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gentle breezes in the days of your times. And look at all of these things that He offers up in the month of Ramadan. People think we're crazy. Right? Going for 30 days in a row. But y'all do drink water during the day, right? <laughs> no, sometimes. Right? And Muslims get excited about it and they get upset when it's over. And, right, you can feel the electricity because all of these things are going on during Ramadan and you can't actually physically see them. I know that. Ramadan seems to have like a special light to it. And you can almost see the light and feel the light, right? Maybe it's because you're going without food and drink for so long, but no, right? There's an almost perceptible, tangible uh, aspect to these uh, attributes of the month that can be perceived with the five physical senses, but really it's because of the strength of the unseen that's happening, right? So tomorrow is the night of better, right? Tomorrow is the night of better. And at the battle of better, the, some of the companions saw the angels, right? Some of the others of the companions saw things that the angels were doing, but they couldn't see the doers. Right? Who was doing the, the things on uh, the field of better? Right? And what is the field of better? We talked in our Wednesday night uh, uh, sessions in uh, the, the, the Gardens of the Righteous about uh, how we deal with those sort of uh, vignettes of the Quran and the Ahadith and the lives of the companions about the battlefield and about military matters when we're not in a combat situation, right? The Deen of Islam has a moral conscience for all people in all circumstances in life. Right? And of course, it's revealed at a time when, there, when pretty much everything is going to be settled in a fight. Okay? Well, not everybody uh, is going to find themselves on a battlefield in life. But for those people who end up there and sometimes never thought that such a thing could ever happen, well, Islam has moral teachings for how one should comport themselves on a battlefield. But does that mean that we should absolutely suspend those teachings altogether if we're not on a battlefield? Doesn't have to be like that. But part of it is being adult enough and mature enough and having enough culture and education to know what is appropriate for circumstances that we are not in and what's appropriate for the circumstances that we are in? So those of you who have been in the Wednesday sessions know uh, that uh, there are parables that can be drawn from the battlefield vignettes that we can take to heart and benefit from and it is much greater and much grander and much more important than our American football analogies Right, that we might use in the boardroom, in the conference room, right, or in business, or in Ramadan, right. So, what is it? Huh? It's uh, huh? You know, when we get to the last ten days, we say it's third and ten, right? Third down, ten yards to go. I'm not going to try to make it fit for the middle, 
section, third and ten, right? There's a football analogy being applied to Ramadan. But let's take a Ghazwati Badr analogy and apply it to Ramadan. The field of Badr is ultimately what? Right? They're standing by the Red Sea, making the decision, do we go for the caravans or we, do we go for the first time ever to stand and deliver in front of the army of Quraysh that's rushing out to defend the caravan that we were looking to take down. And they go for the battle. And of course the Muhajirun have come from Mecca. They were pushed out of their homes. Many of them were tortured. Some of them had family members that were even killed. They've been humiliated, all of these things, and now the, their tormentors are coming out to face them militarily, and they have permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to defend themselves now, because before that, right, they weren't to defend themselves, right, in a martial fashion. So the Muhajirun, are ready to go. They're good to go. They feel like this is intimately connected with them. And the Prophet ﷺ is hearing one testimony after another from companions from the Muhajireen saying, we're good to go, Rasulullah. Right? If you're asking us to choose, we want to meet Quraysh on the battlefields. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, well, I still haven't heard from you yet. I still want to hear what you have to say. And uh, of course, Sa'ad, who is the uh, representative or spokesperson for the Ansar from Medina, steps forward and saying, you keep asking, I still haven't heard what you have to say. And everyone has said enough. It's as if you mean us. And he says, yes. Right? Because the implication is that these are the people from Mecca, this is our issue, we're not going to try to drag you into this. Right? And of course Saad said, we pledged to be with you at every moment, without exception. If you were to march into this ocean right now, not a man from the Ansar would stay behind, but we would march in right behind you. SubhanAllah. And then they go to better. So what is the field of better? It's the field of weathering sacrifice. And the threat of sacrifice, the threat of potential loss to stand by one's commitment to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when you are prepared to weather hardship, to stand by your commitment to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what that means is that you are standing by what Rasulullah represents, what his mission and objective is. And what is the mission and objective of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? To win on battlefields? If you weren't paying attention in class, maybe that's what someone thinks. Or if you were a little bit of a troublemaker, or you were a bully, or you've been bullied, maybe you get hooked up on certain themes in the seerah. But you're distracted from the ultimate ends of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is Nabi Rahma, the Prophet of Compassion, the Prophet of Mercy. He brought, he came to you to give you ultimately freedom and liberation. Because we have a very, very huh, finely tuned definition of freedom. We also care about freedom. In the books of Islamic Ihsan or spirituality, there is a maqam, there is a station called freedom, al hurriya But the difference between us and the people of freedom fries, right, and freedom this and freedom that, right, undefined freedoms, is that we are people of, of definition of ma'rifah, 
of ta'rif and had and what is freedom in the spirituality of, is, of Islam as an objective for a people it is to free your heart from attachments to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but I have bills to pay huh? and mouths to feed right so I can't be an ascetic living on a mountainside some of our great Imams of Ihsan throughout Islamic history forbade their students from leaving the population and living like hermits up in the mountains which is a beautiful place to live right a beautiful place to live there was one sister who said to my wife that I like to go to this particularly remote part of the Muslim world that is very spiritual and all of these things because there everybody follows the deen of Islam. And there was a sister from Scandinavia. Uh, I believe I want to say it wasn't, maybe it was Maybe it was Norway, maybe not, right? But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't Sweden. She was there in the conversation and she said, well, if you're going to a place in the middle of nowhere, I should hope everybody is following the Dean because they're not tested by very much. Of course there's tests there and there's intrigue and, you know, idle hands become the devil's playthings and you have those problems there. But it's another thing to stay among the people. And that's one of the teachings of the Prophet huh? The best of you are the ones who stay with the people and are patient and suffer through their annoyances, right? And the mean and impolite things that they tend to do. SubhanAllah. So better becomes a field <laughs> Huh? Of battle, of, of ba battle, of battle, a proving ground. Right? I grew up in the U.S. Army. Right? So every once in a while, my father would have to go spend a few days at Aberdeen proving grounds. Right? So better becomes a proving ground, a place of temhius, right? Of the rarification of elements. Are you gold or are you chaff? Are you gold or are you lead? Are you those other things? Because when you pull it out of the earth, it's not all sparkling and shiny. When you pull a diamond out of the earth, it's not all sparkling and shiny, right? It's probably unrecognizable to most of us until it gets polished and burnished or melted down and refashioned, chiseled away. Ramadan is that, and that's what happens on the plain of Badr. So part of our acumen, part of our thakatha of the deen is our ability to draw out lessons that are appropriate to our particular situation. Not a situation that we want to live in in our heads or bubbles that we've constructed, constructed or theories about Islam that we've made, but the particular moment that we're responsible for. If some people are upset, well, that's not what I signed up for. I signed up for adventure, right? I, personally, I've got too much adventure in my life. I'm done. I, you know, I would like to retire from event, adventure, right? But, you know, you're responsible for the moment Allah has put you in. لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو Don't wish to meet the enemy. And look at that from two ways as well. Don't wish for some type of conflict, right? Where you're involved in what is the opposite of compassion and mercy. Don't look to get yourself into that situation. But also, don't look to have your faith challenged. Your biggest enemy is your own ego. And those, then those things that would incite and tempt your lower ego to want to rebel against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't wish for those situations, right? 
or situations that are influenced by the shaitan. Situations that are influ in influenced by the Dajjal, right? Or his little operators that run out in front of him, the Dajjajila, that prepare the way for his coming. Don't seek that out. No. But if you find yourself in that situation, then we have teachings to follow. So, we find ourselves in the middle of Ramadan, race to a maghfirah. Right? In this narration and teaching of the Prophet والسلام, we see that this is one of the bounties that is being passed out in these days and these nights. If you can use that moment when your mouth or your throat binds up and all of a sudden you can't swallow and you can't talk and it's a long stretch from suhoor to iftar a long stretch. Or there's moments when you feel fatigued. If you can use that as a reminder of what your objective is, what you're chasing, what you're hunting, what you're pursuing, what you're hoping for, subhanAllah, that's what motivates you. That's what keeps you going. That's Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. I love Ramadan in the summertime because it makes me feel that I'm really giving something to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala radiyallahu anhu wa karamallahu wajha so race one another race with yourselves to this maghfirah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to give it's this maghfirah that can be attained by the individual which is the only reality to our statement that we like to make in the modern world, particularly Muslims in the Western Hemisphere, that we don't have a clergy in Islam. Everyone, every modern Muslim is familiar with that modern statement, right? That statement, we have no clergy in Islam. Well, the only true meaning to that modern statement is that what we don't have is mandatory confession and having to arrange your maghfira through a priesthood, right? As far as a particular class of people that are specifically qualified for jurisprudence, law, theology, and these other things, we do have that. And within that, there is a hierarchy. Right? That is there. And it bears all the way down through history to the time of the Sahaba and the Prophet ﷺ. Right? Now, but that's not our discussion today. This maghfirah is open to you and it's a bounty that Allah gives. If Allah can forgive everything save shirk, and what shirk does Allah not forgive? The shirk that a person will ayyadu billah dies on. The mouth here just got wider. Because there may be someone who is a mushrik right now, an idolater right now, but we don't know what Allah has in store for them. We reject the idolatry. We have no need for that and we see it as unhelpful. But the person engaged as it, it, uh, in it so long as their soul hasn't reached their throat, the way is open. And we don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu while he's prostrating to idols in the Kaaba. Because the Prophet والسلام, never prostrated to idols. And the dominant position among Sunni Imams is that neither did his father Abdullah. Abdul Muttalib was going to sacrifice Abdullah to who? At the Kaaba. To the God, La Tua Izza? No. To Allah. Right? Maybe not the best decision, maybe not the best way forward, maybe not uh, the best way to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But of course, you know, it didn't follow through. 
right? And we have the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam. So if Allah can forgive people, shouldn't we also be able to forgive people? Right? Another aspect of modern uh, sort of these modern goggles that we look at religion through is being judgmental of others. There's only one judge be that he by his own essence, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not judges on the day of judgments. Believe me, someone who uh, sees themselves as judging before the day of judgment is going to show up that day and have a lot of other preoccupations. We have to be careful of looking at things through theoretical glasses, right? Looking at history with the luxury of 2020 vision, historical vision, as if we can judge what so-and-so did on the ground at that time. Had we been on the ground at that time, we would have a very different perspective than the luxury of looking back in the rearview mirror of history. And the same thing about the Day of Judgment. We know and are confident that Allah will give us all justice, but our driving worry should be the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will also be directed toward us. So in this life, Religiosity is not found in being judgmental toward others, right? We don't want our children exposed to the haram. We don't want to hang out and chill with the haram because it's not good for our souls and no, is it good for the development of our children's souls. So we seek to uh, maintain spaces where that doesn't have to be a factor, but more importantly, to educate our children. So that when they are inevitably confronted by that haram, their faith is not shaken. They understand it. They understand that it is a mirage and that its promises are a lie. And they can deal with the world as it is, not keep them in bubbles that are ideal, yet cannot be maintained, but we don't have to mix up or confuse religiosity with running around being judgy toward others. I recently saw a non-Muslim presentation uh, uh, story that had actually a Muslim character in it. It's very interesting how precise they got the Muslim character, and these were actually Americans. Uh, doing it from American culture uh, and uh, American, the history of Islam in this country, American Islam, but the Muslim character was just, the way they portrayed her is that she was just constantly judging and judgy about everything. She disapproved of everything, right? We may disapprove, we may avoid, but that shouldn't be the first and foremost thing that we're known for. We need to be forgiven. كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ The sins of others and our own sins, right, are between those others and their Creator, just like mine are between myself and the one who I hope will forgive me. No. But these things are things that we need forgiveness for, right? All of us are making errors. All of us are making mistakes. What we need to be preoccupied with is turning to Allah, hanging on the doorstep of Allah like Hujaj will hang on the doorstep to the door of the Kaaba, right? So imagine, if you will, the nearness to Allah, in the presence of Allah, meaning in the nearness to Allah and the consciousness of the presence of Allah and hanging at that door that at some times in your life may be closed to you with the knowledge that 
You are where you should be if you are hanging on the doorstep of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, clinging to the doorstep and even if Allah has the door shut on you, you tell him, I am where I need to be. I am camped out on your doorstep and you can keep the door shut for as long as you will, but I'm not going anywhere. And it would be easier for me if you were to open it. But until then, I'm here. SubhanAllah, that's where we need to be. And here we are in the heart of Ramadan, the middle of Ramadan. And if we can come out of this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having relented to us, then here we have the objective. Here we have the maqsid, here we have the purpose, here we have actually the, uh, the metaphor or the idiom in Arabic language of kullu sayyid fi jawf al fara, right? The fara is like the humr al wahsh, right? Like a wild mule that they used to hunt and they would say, if you can get one of these, you've got everything you need, right? So they say, all prey is inside this fara animal that they would hunt, meaning that's the one you're going for. Doesn't work in North America. What will we say here in North America, right? There's people who go out, right? When I was a kid, sometimes they would go out, they would, they would hunt duck, geese, squirrels, right? You know, you're supposed to be a good shot if you can hit a squirrel in one eye and it comes out the other. People would come home with a whole brace of squirrels, right? And they cook it up and be like chicken, right? But that's not Kullu Sayyid, right? In this country, what's Kullu Sayyid? Huh? A buck, a stag, right? To have like how many points, you know, what have you, right? That is the ultimate. So if we were to strike that same parable here, you could go out and come back with a squirrel, but if you came out, came back with a buck, a male deer with all the points, right? Now you've got, there's nothing bigger than that. Because we don't, we're not gonna eat the grizzly even if we hunt it, right? Right, we're not gonna eat that. SubhanAllah. Plus a grizzly bear, that's not even halal. Right? But you can eat the deer. No. SubhanAllah. So if we can come out of this with this maghfira, maghfiratin, there's also, right, sabiqu ila maghfiratin, in that indefinite form of maghfira, there's also this implication that it's attainable. Allah doesn't make it impossible for you to get it. SubhanAllah. The Messenger says in three places about Ramadan, من صام رمضان إيمانا واحتسابا غفر له ما تقدم من ذنبه. Whoever fasts this month, إيمانا واحتسابا. And what is that? إيمانا, clearly having conviction. احتسابا. I'm sure you all. I know you all have heard this before. What type of translations of احتسابا are you working with? What does this احتسابا mean? Accountability. Accountability, hisab, muhasaba, right? It has that meaning. Jazakallah khair, thank you for your class participation, right? That's better than uh, getting the answer on the head, it's just participating. Anybody want to take another stab at ihtisaba? Out of in faith, meaning belief, conviction that the promise of Allah is true. And what is ihtisaban? So, accountability. Accounting, right? An accountant is a muhasib. Ihtisaban, muhasaba. Tayyip, here, right? Hisab is the count. Ihtisab is taking count. Here, ihtisaban is fasting Ramadan in conviction in the truth of the promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ihtisaban counting on the truth of the fact that my reward will be secured with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether in this life or in the akhirah, that I am 
definitely putting something, that confidence. I am putting something in my account with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I may not cash in now but might actually cash in at an even better time than now when I need it most, when I stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I may have trepidation about my errors and my faults and my shortcomings, but I'm doing this because I know it's true. I have faith. And I know that what I do, I believe that Allah does not allow the sincere effort of any man or any woman to be lost. And so I make this particular effort that I seek to collect when I will need it most. Ghufira, whoever does that, and then there's all the reward for the that, gets the ghufran in Ramadan for what preceded of his dhunub and what comes after of her dhunub if they hit it on the head. They fast right according to the jurisprudence. I don't mean the complicated, sophisticated jurisprudence of the advanced students who like to, right? Some of us are thick nerds, right? And we go into the details. Those details are actually very important because it's your intimate knowledge of the details that, uh, what is it, enables you to find solutions for believers in cases that are often not regular cases, but irregular cases, right? So don't discount the details, but I mean the main lines of fiqh that every believer who has a full-time career and a family to raise can know. You got your fiqh right. Your intention was for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You're honest about what you're trying to do here. Allah asks honesty, not perfection. Allah asks <coughs> that you make an effort. Right? Your ijtihad, it's called ijtihad in the fiqh, to see the moon is your effort, not your exactitude, we're not trying to land uh, a spacecraft on Mars, right? That takes a different set of mathematics, right? This is theology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks for your honesty. What could happen is that this Ramadan becomes that Ramadan, right? It goes the opposite direction of the Maghfira in the verse, Right? The standard use of definite and indefinite articles. This goes from a Ramadan to the Ramadan. That Ramadan. Right? And we've been practicing Ramadans for a while now. Right? We should be getting to the one where we're, you know, primed and ready. Huh? To make it that Ramadan. But with honesty, if you can hit that, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. The second one, men qama Ramadan, whoever stands, so the first was whoever fasts Ramadan, iman muhtasaban, but whoever stands for Ramadan. And what is the standing in Ramadan? Obviously the tarawiyah, right? Obviously those eight raka'at before Fajr, right? That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed all year round and even in Ramadan. Right? He stuck to his eight raka'at of tahajjud before fajr. Right? That is a qiyam. And technically the tarawiyah is after isha, so that is also technically a qiyam. No. Tahajjud is after you've slept. Qiyam is when you stand after you've completed your salawat for the day, after isha. So every Standing after Isha is a Qiyam, but not every Qiyam is a Tahajjud. But this is the Qiyam, and whoever does that, Iman and Wahtisaban, standing, wanting, hoping, desiring, knowing, with confidence and Yaqeen, huh? with nothing in your heart but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why Ramadan can even be a vacation for the soul. 
Because when we fast and become weak from the fasting, right, the body and the soul start to separate a little bit. Huh? And if, I mean, you could get down on the wrong side and said, you know, say to your soul, all right, you go on ahead and I'm going to stay here with the physical, right? Or you could, when the separation says, you just say, I'm going to ride with the soul this month, right? Inshallah, right? You're more soul than body, and that's one of the effects of fasting. Now, subhanAllah. And the third, من قام ليلة القدر Whoever stands the night of power. When is the night of power? Don't answer. Right? We have educated probabilities, but ultimately we know that we don't know. Should we get mad at the larger community for only coming out on the 27th? No. Look at these people, they all only come out on the 27th. If you're in the Muslim world, anybody done Ramadan in the Muslim world? SubhanAllah. 27th night? Oh, right? First Fajr of the day of fasting. First Fajr of the day of fasting. Oh my gosh. People are praying in the streets at Fajr time. Right? SubhanAllah. 27th, right? People all come out. We don't censure them. We don't judge them. That's what they can do right now. And they came out. It's a bunch of people still at home. But these people came out. There's hope. It seems that they're lackadaisical. All you got is the 27th for Allah. That pessimistic, judgmental voice is misplaced because I'm looking using the eyes that Allah gave me to look at what is not my business to look at. SubhanAllah. They came out, MashaAllah. But uh, Laylatul Qadr is hidden and will remain hidden because the effect would be lost if it was delineated and named. Because what Allah wants from you is to look for it, to seek it, to hope for it, think about it, wonder about it, desire it, and make that effort to find it and hit it. Look for it on the odd nights, but sometimes, right? Not like this year, mashallah, but in most years, we're not exactly certain of the start of the month. Right? We're not certain. Okay? So there's a chance that even an odd may not necessarily bind. So we go even an odd as well. And we do a little something for Laylatul Qadr on the times of its possibilities, even though we might make a special concerted effort huh, to celebrate and glorify the Sha'air of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because to stand for Laylatul Qadr is a sha'ira of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not in any other deen, only in Islam. It was the night that the Qur'an was revealed, right? And sent down to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, right? So it can't be from any other deen. So it is a sha'ira specific to the deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken of, so we celebrate it. Part of that celebration is making that effort for Laylatul Qadr. Now, making that effort for Laylatul Qadr and also seeking it. Whoever stands the night of power out of faith and counting their reward for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything that preceded and will come of their sins is forgiven. We ask Allah to let us hit that night. We ask Allah to give us that result in our standing. We ask Allah to give us that forgiveness in our fasting. That when we make that intention, right? On the Shafi'i school, it's actually mandatory to intend every single day of fasting because you can't not have niyyah for your prayer, right? You can't make niyyah for Fajr and say, well, that should cover the rest of the, the other four for the day. Right? So they see each day 
as an isolated day of fasting. You make intention for the month, but you make intention for each day. In the Hanafi school, you make intention for the month at the beginning, and both are valid and good. We only ask that people be consistent. But there's that facet of attaching my own personal sense and driver of purpose to each day anew. And when we make that, I usually make my intention at, at uh, Tarawiyah, right? Or when I'm breaking the fast, I intend for the following day. It has to be right after Maghrib. Uh, but attaching that intention, and then why? Because I want this maghfirah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I need this compassion and gentleness. And my family needs this compassion and gentleness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I could get out at the end of this Ramadan with freedom from the fire, right? Then mashallah, that will be, will be in the end zone. Right? Subhanallah. And then we'll have a lot to celebrate on Eid. So let's not be that poor person who spends all Eid, everybody's happy and celebrating, and they're saying, oh, I could have done better. SubhanAllah. Hopefully I make it again to the next year, but the next year's promise to no one. Allah forgive us. Mm -hmm. right? Allah pardon us. Mm -hmm. Allahumma innaka afuun kareemun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anna. Mm -hmm. Allah, you pardon others, right? <clears throat> you pardon people. You are generous, so pardon us, O oh generous one, yeah. right? Tajawaz anna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't benefit from punishing us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't benefit from huh, uh, disciplining us. We are the ones who benefit, but let's not... We we'll ask Allah to enable us to not be that hard-headed slave that only understands with a stick. Subhanallah. Barakallahu feekum. Allah give you all much maghfirah, much afu. The generosity of Allah, right? Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajwad al-nas. He was the most generous of the people. Wa ajwadu, huh? Wa ajwadu ma yakunu fi Ramadan. Wa ida kanat, huh? Al-layali alati yatihi al-jabriyu. Alayhi salam, right? Kana ajwada min arih al mursala. And on the nights that Jabriel would come to him at the end of Ramadan, he was huh, like a breeze released across the land, right? It covers everything and nothing stops it, right? Subhanallah. Inshallah, we get caught up in that. Breeze from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam of his contentment and his being proud of us and our actions. I'malu fasayyar Allahu a'malakum wa Rasuluhu wal mu'minun. Work, make effort, because Allah will see your effort and His messenger. And of course, the believers on the day of judgment. Right? If one of you says salawat and salam to me. My soul is returned to me and I return the salams to that person. Sallallahu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Barakallahu feekum wa ahsana ilaykum. You all have a wonderful Saturday in the middle of Ramadan. Ayyadakum Allah. Remember me at your iftar, inshallah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allah bless us in our Ramadan. We're at the very end, right? So our sessions have been about three sets of ten. The first ten, the middle ten, and the third ten, the third and final ten. So <clears throat> each of these sessions have been in threes, okay, about each of the three ten sets of days in Ramadan. But in this final set, we'll look at the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Anbiya, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem, La yahzunuhum ul-faza'u al-akbar, La yahzunuhum ul-faza'u al-akbar, wa tatalaqahum ul-mala'ikatu, Hada yawmukum al-ladhi kuntum tu'adun. 
So about the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they will not be grieved by the great terror. And the angels will meet them with greetings. In the Quran it doesn't say saying, but in the English they figure we can't follow the literary style, so it says saying. But the, literally in the Quran it says, they will not be grieved by the great terror, and the angels will meet them. This is your day, the day that you were promised. SubhanAllah. Inshallah, we make it there. Okay. This is your day. Okay. This is not our day. Right. The dunya is not the day of the believer. Some of our brothers and sisters have become so far in a distance, separated from the teachings of their own deen, that in the name of their own deen, they insist on this day being the day of the believer. We're not saying put off success. We're not saying put off victory. The best Muslim is the strong Muslim, right? We go for success, tawfiq, right? Ihsan, katab Allah al-ihsan ala kulli shay. We go for precision. We're not fatalists. But in the ultimate scheme of reality, we realize that this is the house of tribulation and the house of rest and repose is in the Akhirah. Right? That way we don't need to complain. Before a hundred years ago, the ulama didn't used to be poor like they are now. Right? They had um, massive endowments like the biggest elite Ivy League universities all over the world. These were stolen during the middle of the uh, 20th century. Uh, and then you have the result that, uh, uh, that we have today. It's, it's interesting uh, that it sort of dawns on you that the people, many of the people who might make fun of the ulama for being poor, it's their grandparents or great-grandparents sometimes that actually stole the endowments <laughs> that uh, had us end up this way. But in great cities like Damascus and Cairo and uh, all over the world, and not just the Arab world, right? There are massive portions of land, right? The proceeds from either the harvest or the rents and all of this thing, right, went into right supporting uh, the educational centers and the different programs that were run by the scholars, subhanAllah. But, uh, for example, the great Hadith scholar Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, Right? He had very fine horses, very fine robes, right? And when he'd ride with his students who were all, right, if you're a top scholar, most of your students are wearing turbans, right? Meaning they're all ulama. And when I studied with Sayyidina al-Sheikh, Adib al-Kallas, right? There were certain uh, days during the week for his long-time students. And in the class, you had muftis and scholars who were considered uh, senior scholars all over the city, but ultimately they were sitting in the class of their shaykh, Muhammad al-Dil al-Kallas, Allah So, as the story goes, Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani is riding, right, on a horse, and he has his people with him, they're all on horseback, fine robes through the marketplace. And there's a Jewish man right, who works with boiling oil. I don't know what he's boiling or what he's doing, but his clothes are burnt and singed and stained and they smell terrible and you know his work is just dirty and really miserable okay and that's just his lot in life and he sees what is called Amir al-Mu'mineen the top scholars in hadith are called Amir al-Mu'mineen fil hadith so he sees Amir al-Mu'mineen Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani the author of Fath al-Bari riding through the marketplace he becomes so incensed, so angry, right, so annoyed that he jumps out in the way and he grabs a hold of the bridle of the horse of Ibn Hajar, right, and he accosts him, this is a non-believer, and he says to the scholar, he says to Imam Ibn Hajar, he said, your prophet, 
Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the salat wa atam wa taslim. Your Prophet said that this world is the Jannah of the Kafir and the prison of the believer. Billahi alayk, right? I, I beseech you, tell me, what kind of paradise am I in right now and what type of prison are you in? Ibn Hajjah says, right, compared to what I'm going to have in the next life, inshallah, this is a prison for me. And compared to what you're going to have in the next life, if you stay the way you are, this is a Jannah, believe me. SubhanAllah. They will not be grieved by the great terror. They will be saved from the horrors of the day of judgment and of the hellfire, inshallah. But despair, right? What is despair? This type of grief and this worry, right? Despair is to lose all hope or confidence. Despair, hopelessness, disheartenment, dismay, depression, despondency. Despair is the opposite of hope. Hope, on the other hand, raja, to cherish a desire with anticipation. As in he hopes for a promotion. You have hope, expectation, desire, longing, wishing, fancy, want, eagerness. Both of these two, despair and hope, are ways of thinking about the future. Despair is a negative view to the future, while hope is a positive view of the future. Despair and its brother and sister, anxiety and stress, are a taste of the hellfire that a person experiences in the life of this world. All of us seek to extricate ourselves from pain and discomfort. All of us seek relief and release and freedom from suffering. And here we are in Ramadan. A month, the first of it is compassion. The middle of it is forgiveness. forgiveness. And the seal, conclusion, end of it is freedom from the fire. And what is the fire? Ultimately, what is the worst part of Jahannam? Not the worst, like, spot, the worst piece of real estate in Jahannam. What is the worst aspect of Jahannam? Hmm? Worse. Separation from war. Being eternally exiled for eternity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the worst part. How does it feel if you get separated from a loved one? How does it feel if someone that you love dearly rejects you? Huh? It hurts. A pain that physical pain sometimes doesn't even match. Right? That's the worst part of the hellfire is exile from the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exile from the contentment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here we are in Ramadan. We have a chance. Right? It's third and ten. Okay? For those who understand our football analogies, third down, ten yards to go. It's the 22nd of Ramadan, I believe. 1438, I believe. Right? This was a khutbah that I gave in Abu Dhabi eight years ago. On Friday, which was also the 21st of Ramadan, like yesterday was. These last 10 days are a special period of increased worship. Prophet used to become seriously focused during these days and was distracted by nothing. Right? These are the days of Atikaf, taking up residence in the masjid or camping out in the masjid or sequestering oneself in the masjid every moment spent in a true mosque. Right? There's a special blessing. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way to al-i'tikaf ma dumtu fi hadhi al-masjid. Right? I've intended i'tikaf so long as I'm in this masjid. You can make that intention every time you walk into the a true masjid, a true mosque, 
right? Any time of the year. But what's the true mas? Right. What's that? No, true mas is not owned by any man or men or women. Right? It has to be owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be eternally dedicated right, to Allah. Right? It can't be owned by anyone. So you have to set up a trust for it to be a true mosque. It can't be a rented space. Okay? So you could use a rented space as a place to meet and a place to practice, and you could, uh, you could decide that we are all going to intend to treat this place as a mosque, which is a healthy thing for a believer to have that place, but you don't have the ajr of etikaf, right? Women don't have to wait out until their cycle is over. Right? And so on and so on. And these other rules don't apply. In these days, we have Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power better than a thousand months. Whoever spends the night standing in prayer on the night of power uh, is forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that goes before and everything that comes after. But how is it that the end of a month could be freedom of the fire, from the fire. We asked the same question at the beginning. How is it that a month could have a beginning that is compassion? How is it that it could have a middle that is forgiveness? Like, how does that even make sense? A month is a time period, right? Not to et kun min and nar, or freedom from the fire. So the point is, our scholars say, that the logical conclusion of forgiveness, if someone is forgiven, it has to be suspension of punishment, freedom from having to do time, right? Inshallah, we don't have to do time, and Allah just lets us go straight in. Mm -hmm. Ya Rabbi, please don't give us what we deserve, but give us from your generosity. SubhanAllah. The Muslim who fasts and prays in faith and counting on a reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that if they do this, Allah has promised, and I believe in that promise, builds up such an account of forgiveness during the month that it has to come to a crescendo at the end with this logical conclusion. If someone's forgiven, right? They're not supposed to be punished. All the portions of forgiveness that he or she is amassing during the beginning and middle of the month much must tip the scales at the end. So for those fortunate dedicated souls, Allah will reward them with the ends, the logical conclusion of forgiveness to be freed from exile, to be freed from punishment, to be freed from fire. There's groups that he gives this to at the beginning of the month, in the middle of the month, on every night of the month he actually has people that he sets free from the fire. Allah make us the ones that got it on the first day. Yeah. But we'll take the second day. Or the third or the fourth or the fifth or the sixth, right? But it's not hard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give it to us and He has it to give. SubhanAllah. And if you're genuinely excited about that possibility, if that possibility genuinely grips you, huh? SubhanAllah. That's sincerity and that's the ikhlas that Allah is looking for. But if your attitude is, yeah, maybe, right? Well, that's not the type of enthusiasm that Allah is looking for, right? But, you know, it's not for me to dictate the terms of Allah's generosity, right? It's like an ocean, right? Just give it, and everybody gets wet, right? Inshallah. But, subhanAllah, so how is it that on every night but the end of the month, at one point they're saying every night there's a group, but at the end of the month there's a group. The believers, they say, are at varying degrees of righteousness and piety, right? They have different degrees of the severity of their sins and their misdeeds. So there are some who may get freed on the first night of the month, and some may take two days or three, right? And others, right, their judge, the judgment in their case might be postponed to the very end. Allah let us out of our own selves, because ultimately that's it, right? At the center of 
every single misdeed is being pleased with oneself. Right? At the bottom, at the head, the, the statement literally goes, Ratsu, kullu khati'ah. So the Rats is like the chief, the head, the, uh, the president of every, right? At the lead, at the essence, the essence, so that's probably the best way to translate it, the essence of every misdeed or error or sin is being pleased with oneself. Somewhere else, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, مَنْ عَرَفَ نَفْسَهُ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ Whoever knows himself knows his Lord. So at one extreme you have people who are self-satisfied, pleased with themselves, content with the status of their own ego, or seen for themselves as having some great status. At the other extent, you have people who have self-awareness. Right? They see their own flaws. They have the capacity for self-criticism, self-critique. And so there's hope that this person could become a better person. But if this other person is already convinced that I've got nothing to change, I'm good just the way I am, that statement right there, whoever has an Adam's weight of arrogance in their heart will never enter Jannah, right? I'm just proud and brothers got to accept that, right? Somebody said that once when we were young, in college. Probably in a better place than me right now. So, those who receive this release, this freedom, will enter into a vast and expansive garden. That's what we're talking about. The Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that Jannah, there's all types of things. There's all types of wonderful things. In it is what no eye has seen and no uh, ear has heard and the thought of which has never crossed the mind of a person. But even more, in it is no sorrow, only relief, only comfort, every joy. The question comes up, well, this group is going to get this and this group has said that you're going to get this, so, you know, what about this, this and this? Look. What you need to know about the Jannah is that you will not feel like you're missing out on anything. That's the whole premise. You won't feel like anyone has something that you don't. That doesn't, that doesn't even enter into Jannah. That's, it has no place. No one is going to feel like they're missing out. And everyone is going to be happy. Okay? So whatever we hear, whatever we think, what we need to know is that there's only contentment for the people who get in. There's only satisfaction and there's only joy and there's only relief. And this world is a test. This is the place of being upset. This is the place of feeling left out. Not there. Right? Not there. And those who have a connection to the world of there don't feel left out here. Because they look beyond the slights and the disappointments of the place that is set up just for disappointment. Ibn Hibban narrates from the Prophet والسلام, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَعْدَدْتُ لِعِبَادِ الصَّالِحِينَ مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرْ وَمِسْدَاقُ ذَلِكَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ It's one hadith from Ibn Hibban, if you ever wondered right, where these statements come from. Right, here it is. Allah says, I have prepared for my righteous slaves what no eye has seen and no ear has heard. Who's saying this? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one who لا يمتقو عن الهوى He doesn't speak from his own desires or, or, or passions or caprice إن هو إلا وحي يوحى It is only revelation. And what has never been conceived by a human heart and he says the truth of this is found in the book of Allah no soul knows what has been hidden for it of things that would bring coolness to the eye 
as a reward for their efforts. The whole phrase, coolness to the eye, kodra to eye, right? The delight of the eye, right? When you see it, it's your soul, right? Uh, it's like the coolness of contentment has overcome your heart, right? It's a delight, right? What you, you know, seeing it, right, makes you feel delighted. So this garden, right, it's a landscape, right? It's a vista, it's a view, sweet water, sweeter fruit, and all of it, the results of Allah's forgiveness. مَثَلُ جَنَّةِ الَّتِي وَعِدَ الْمُتَّقُونَ فِيهَا أَنْهَارٌ مِنْ مَاءٍ غَيْرِ آسِنِينَ وَأَنْهَارٌ مِنْ لَبَنٍ لَمْ يَتَغَيَّرْ تَعْمُ Here is a parable of the garden which the righteous are promised in it are rivers of water, incorruptible rivers of milk of which the taste never changes, rivers of wine, a joy to those who drink, rivers of honey pure and clear in it. There are for them all kinds of fruits, a grace from their Lord. SubhanAllah. There's wine in the Jannah, but the wine of the Jannah is not like the wine of the earth. What happens? Right. I'll tell you. Right. I shouldn't ask you. I shouldn't ask you, right? What happens when you drink too much wine? Right? You drink too much wine. One, right? It all tastes like urine. Okay? If you drink too much of it, what happens? Huh? You get dizzy, you get sick, you throw up, the next day you have a headache. Huh? What happens when someone is under the influence of intoxication? Uh, their senses are dulled, their reaction time is delayed, okay, they don't have their wits about them, and they usually make a fool of themselves. The wine of the Jannah, right, leaves no sada, right, there's no headache. It only, it doesn't depress a person, right, but increases their senses and awareness, right? Yes, it has that uplifting uh, spirit, it may have that sweetness to it, right? of a grape wine or so and so, but it has the opposite effect of the wine of the earth, right? SubhanAllah. But the intoxication, the delight of intoxication is there without losing one's senses, right? So there's a difference between the two. The garden is a place of comfort, a place of relaxation. Fiha ayun jariya, fiha sururum marfu'a, wa akwabum mawdu'a, wa namariku masfufa, Therein will be a babbling spring. Therein will be thrones of dignity raised high so you don't have to listen to the meditation soundtrack when you try to sleep and relax, right? With the water sounds and the wind sounds and all of that. It's the real thing. Thrones of dignity raised on high, goblets placed ready, and cushions set in rows and rich carpets all spread out, a place of free running water and pleasant richness. For them will uh, for them will be gardens of eternity beneath them rivers will flow they will be adorned therein with bracelets of gold and they will wear green garments of fine silk and heavy brocade they will recline therein on raised thrones how good the recompense how beautiful a couch to recline on its fruit and pleasures are constant and its company and comforts and a so are a solace for the soul wa bashirin ladina amanu wa amilu salihati anna lahum jannatin tajri min tahtiha al anharu kullama ruziqu minha min thamaratin rizqa qalu hadha alladhi ruzaqna min qablu but give glad tidings to those who believe and work righteousness that their portions, portion is the gardens beneath which rivers flow. Every time they are fed with fruits therefrom, they say, why, this is what we were fed with before. For they are given things in similitude and they have therein companions pure and holy and they abide therein forever. Right? They're given fruit and they said, this is the same that we got before, but every time the taste right, is going to vary and be more impressive than the time before. But there's going to be those people who don't make it. Allah save us from being in that group. 
They will not be granted entrance in the garden. They will be told to stop, stop. This is not going to be your destination, and those will be the worst words you've ever heard in your life. Right? The words of banishment. Worse than anything you think you might have suffered in this world. Right? This will be the worst. They will be forbidden and denied access. They'll miss the boat. Some faces that day will be humiliated, laboring hard and weary with Billah. The while they enter the blazing fire, the while they are given to drink of a boiling hot spring, no food will there be for them but a bitter dhariya, which will neither nourish nor satisfy hunger. They will be surrounded with pain and agony, for an eternity death will harass them from every direction, but never put them out of their mercy. وَاسْتَفْتَحُوا وَخَابَ كُلُّ جَبَّارٍ عَنِيدٍ مِنْ وَرَائِهِ جَهَنَّمُ وَيُسْفَى مِنْ مَاءٍ صَدِيدٍ but they sought victory and decision there and then, and frustrated was the lot of every powerful, obstinate transgressor. In front of such a one is hell, and he is given for drink boiling fetid water. In gulps will he sip it, but never will he bear swallowing it down his throat. Death will come to him from every quarter, yet he will not die, and in front of him will be a chastisement unrelenting. They will thirst, but the scorching water they are given will rip their insides to shreds. And they will be given to drink boiling water so that it cuts up their bowels to pieces. The fire will close in on them like a prison, and their only reprieve will be a rain of boiling water. Naran ahata bihim suradipuha wa iyastaghithu yuhafu bima'in kel muhli. Yeshwil wujuha bitsa sharahu sa'at murtafaqa. For the wrongdoers, we have prepared a fire whose smoke and flames like the walls and roof of a tent will hem them in. If they implore relief, they will be granted water like melted brass that will scald their faces. How dreadful the drink, how uncomfortable the couch to rely on, to recline on. Every time they try to climb out, they will be beaten back down into it with iron clubs and Surat al-Hajj. With it will be with it will be scalded what is within their bodies as well as their skins. In addition, there will be maces of iron to punish them. Every time they wish to get away their from from anguish they will be forced back therein and it will be said taste you the penalty of burning chained by their necks they will be dragged through liquid fire <laughs> when the yoke shall be round their necks and the chains they shall be dragged along in the boiling fetid fluid then in the fire shall they be burned every time their skin is burnt off they will receive a new skin to suffer the agony of having it burnt off once more. Inna ladina kafaru bi ayatina sawfa nuslihim naran kullama nadijat juluduhum baddalnahum juludan ghayraha liyadhuku al-adaba inna allaha kana Aziz and Hakima, those who reject our signs, we shall soon cast into the fire. As often as their skins are roasted through, we shall change them for fresh skins. 
that they may taste the penalties for Allah is exalted in power and wise. SubhanAllah. The one who created this world has the ability to create other worlds. SubhanAllah. There's people in this world who may not believe in the existence of heaven and hell. Right? I can understand that. But I would sure hate to be in their shoes on the day when a choice is being made, right, and find out that I was wrong. There's no way, however, right, there's no way to prove the existence of the garden and the fire, right? You can't prove that empirically in this world. Right? You can't even prove it with logic, right? It's something from faith. You either believe what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, or you don't. There's other things that can be proven, even with logic, like the existence of God, the existence of the Creator can be proven with logic, right? right? That's obvious, but there's certain things, like the punishment of the grave, that once you have other things proven by logic, or empiric empirically, like for example, huh, the intact nature of the Qur'an can be proven empirically, using scientific method. Right? There's no doubt whatsoever that this was brought to us by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And through linguistic analysis and logic itself, we can see that the Qur'an is a coherent book. There's other aspects with it that demonstrate its truth. But other things we depend only on the report of a prophet. Only on the report of revelation. There's no way. Otherwise, except for a miracle. A miracle can prove the truth of what is reported by the prophet. And the question is, can you allow for miracles? Do you have space in your life for miracles? Some people right, don't have any space in their lives for miracles. It can't be. There must be some other explanation. What is a miracle in Christian, uh, not Christian, but uh, in the English dictionary, a miracle is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. An extremely outstanding or unusual event, thing, or accomplishment. In Christian science, it says, I don't know what dictionary, I think I'm getting this from the Oxford English Dictionary, a divinely natural phenomenon experienced humanly as the fulfillment of spiritual law. But in our sacred law, in the teachings of Sharia, a ma'jiza is al amrul khariq lil ada bi qayri an yakuna ba'da risala. Did I translate that? Try it again. Right. It is an event that breaks the natural norms with the condition that it takes place after the claim of prophecy, right? It's coupled with this person, this prophet's claim to be sent by God. And then the norms of the world are broken, like water flowing uphill instead of downhill, at the moment of that claim, such that we know that the world itself doesn't operate this way. Only the creator of the world could force it to do something that it's not normal for it to do. It means that when a truthful, trustworthy prophet is telling you of the existence of unseen realities, at that very moment the norms and habits of nature, as we know them, are broken. <laughs> Such as splitting the moon. Okay? I'm a prophet. I'm sent to you by your Creator, and the truth of what I'm saying is that my Creator who sent me will now do something that no human being can do, and the moon splits, for example. Such as fresh water gushing forth from between his fingers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such as his predicting the future in such a way as to allow his enemies to willfully prove him wrong, yet they do not. Right? He could have disproven the entire Qur'an, right? If he had a mind to, but Allah knew he wouldn't. And he didn't. 
such as him speaking in an unreplicable uh, literary prose, more <laughs> elegant than poetry itself, and defying generations and natures and nations to try to outdo it. A miracle is when the power that controls and regulates the norms of nature and the orbit of the planets and the seasons causes them to alter their course and break their habits in correlation to the claim of this man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to know and tell you of the unseen. Right? The truth of these miracles right, is what impels us to believe the reports about the unseen. It's as if this overwhelming supreme power has just said to the doubting world, he speaks the truth. Right? That's the way our scholars actually define it, right? The miracle as it is as if God has said, my slave is telling the truth about what he's telling you about me, Allah says. Heaven and hell may or may not be true. Logically, they could go both ways, right? According to logic, paradise and its opposite, right, are not, can't be disproven. It can't be proven, but it also can't be disproven. That's the reality of it. Unless someone has issues in their heart, their heart, they deem, right, they're caught up, right, in some type of cynicism, right, then they insist on you know, forcing uh, only certain conclusions. SubhanAllah. The multiverse theory, if any of you have heard of that in philosophy of science, right? One, it's a fantasy. Two, there is absolutely no way whatsoever to demonstrate it or prove it, right? And three, it's just an awkward way to go about saying that the finely tuned calibration of the earth does not mean that someone, right, intended uh, for it to be this way, okay? And that defeats the purpose of Occam's razor, right? Science is all about the simplest explanation, okay? But when you see the finely tuned calibration of all of the aspects of the atmosphere and the earth and the seasons and gravitational pull and all of that, that this is the only planet we found so far that can support carbon-based life. Well, there's a simple solution. And then there's a very awkward ways to avoid that simple solution. SubhanAllah. But, logically, it could go either way. Personally, I'd rather not be on the wrong side of logic if we find out that it went the way of all of the prophets who have ever come to the earth, right? Those unfortunate souls who are still of weak conviction and narrow vision may want to at least consider Pascal's wager. Y'all know Pascal's wager? You know it? Say it in the fine blue shirt, my favorite color. Do you remember Pascal? Pas principle? Like... Tell me. Like the math one or the physics one? Um, did two. The one about the existence of God. Oh, I don't know that. So Pascal's wager, right, is that we don't know if God exists or not. Right? But what I lose by obedience uh, is nothing compared to what I would lose if it turns out to be true. First of all, that's not faith. Right? That's not acceptable in the deen of Islam. But it was an exercise, right, that uh, Pascal uh, brought to Western, uh, Western, uh, you know, intellectual thinking. Okay, but some people might want to think about that. Some people might want to think about that. There may be some who find the promises of paradise too far off. It's too far away. Right now, I'm dealing with the here and now. Okay, I can't think that far ahead, even though it might be before iftar tonight. Allah keep us safe. Mm -hmm. huh? but we can all admit that the stress and anxiety and worry that many of us experience in the life of this world, right, you're still too young for stress and anxiety and worry. Right? It's going to get worse, don't worry. <laughs> but inshallah, Allah is going to make you strong and you're going to handle everything that you confront. Right? Some people may feel Right? That this is 
and taste of the flavors of hellfire itself. Because it can get like hell sometimes. Gham huh? is a word in Arabic that's in the Quran, it's in the statements of the Prophet It can be translated as grief, affliction, sorrow, distress, and sadness, worry, anxiety. Hem, huh? anxiety, concern, huh? worry, care, affliction, intention. We say this because the anxiety and worry that we experience in this life is a weed whose source grows out of the hellfire itself. It's a little taste of the hellfire. Anxiety tortures the occupants of hell itself. In hell, they have anxiety and worry, right? And that gripping feeling, you're not relieved from it in the hellfire. Okay, you don't get away from it. You don't ex escape it. That's part of the torture. Hmm? And the anxiety of the tortures of the occupants of hell when they realize that they miss their chance to do right in the world. Unlike the people of the Jannah, who are not going to feel like they missed out on anything. But the people of the hellfire will be constantly reminded of all of those things that they could have done differently and what they could have had had they done, taken, made the right choices. In the Quran, in Surah Fatir, therein will they cry aloud for assistance, our Lord, bring us out. We shall work righteousness, not the deeds we used to do. Did we not give you long enough life so that he that would should receive admonition? And moreover, the warner came to you. So taste the fruits of your deeds. For the wrongdoers, there is no help, helper. They regret being so insolent and ungrateful in the earth. The day that their faces will be turned upside down in the fire, they will say, Woe to us, would that we had obeyed Allah and obeyed the Messenger. But regret is too late. وَنَادَى أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ and أَفِيضُ عَلَيْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ The companions of the fire will call to the companions of the garden, pour down to us water or anything Allah has provided for your sustenance, and they will say, both these things Allah has forbidden to those who rejected him. Ya Rabbi, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka faqina adab al -nar. Humiliation combined with disappointment to turn into despair. And the focus in this part is on the emotional distress, right, of being rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa nada ashabul jannati, ashab al nari, and qad wajadana ma wa'adana rabbuna haqqa, fahal wajadtum ma wa'ada rabbukum haqqa. The companions of the garden will call out in return to the companions of the fire, saying, We have indeed found the promises of our Lord to us to be uh, to us to be true. Have you also found your Lord's promises to be true? And they shall say yes. But a crier shall proclaim between them the curse of Allah is on the wrongdoers. It's the same thing that the Prophet ﷺ said to the casualties of the mushrikeen after they were thrown into the well at the Ghazwati Badr. He calls out to them saying, We found the promise of our Lord to be true. Have you found the promise of your Lord to be true? The Umar says, You're talking to dead huh? bodies, Rasulullah. You know, how is this? And he said, you don't hear me any better than they do. When we heard that when Allenby right, blazed through Palestine and up into Syria and took Damascus in World War I, that he, was, he, uh, he demanded to be taken to the grave of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi by the Amwi Mosque, behind the Amwi Mosque. And as the story goes, uh, he went up to the grave of Salah al-Din, who all the Europeans knew 
and even respected. And he kicked the side of the grave. Um, and he said, Salah al -Din, where are your sons now? So remembering what the Prophet والسلام, did at better, one of the times that I was teaching in England, right, I demanded to be taken to Allenby's grave. And we found it right, in Westminster Abbey, right, in one of the naves of the chapel. And return the favor. Mm -hmm. right? Let him know. <laughs> right? Here we are. SubhanAllah. And I asked him, did you find the promise of your Lord to be true? Humiliation comes with disappointment, and then it turns into despair. SubhanAllah. They are tortured by the sight of lost opportunities and denial where there had once been. Pride and overconfidence, Allah, save us from pride. But for those who realize the error of their ways while there's still time, who perform their due diligence and cease and desist from their wrong action, demonstrate remorse and seek to make amends, they stand a chance to gain a pardon, to commute, their sentence, وَالَّذِينَ عَمِلُوا السَّيِّئَاتِ ثُمَّ تَابُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهَا وَآمَنُوا إِنَّ رَبَّكَ مِنْ بَعْدِهَا لَغَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ But those who do wrong but repent thereafter and truly believe verily, your Lord is thereafter oft forgiving. Allahumma gfir lana, most merciful. Allahumma arhamna. They have the chance to experience clemency of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ثُمَّ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لِلَّذِينَ عَمِلُوا السُّوءَ بِجَهَالَةٍ ثُمَّ تَابُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ وَأَصْلَحُوا إِنَّ رَبَّكَ مِنْ بَعْدِ هَالَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ But verily your Lord, to those who do wrong in ignorance, but who thereafter repent and make amends, your Lord after all this is oft forgiving, most merciful. Sometimes we might get caught up in that little qayd, in ignorance. Oh, that doesn't apply to me because I did know better. But the scholars of Quran say that anyone who finds themselves doing something that is not in alignment with what Allah has requested, at that moment they're definitely ignorant. Right? So it does include you. Allah he has forgiveness to give to those who make an effort to seek it in the Sahih al-Bukhari from Abu Huraira. The Prophet says, alayhi salam, bayna rajulun yamshi, fashtadda alayhi al-atash, fanazala bi'ran, fashariba minha, thumma kharaja, fa ila huwa bi kalbin yalhab, huh? yalhab, right? So there was a man from, uh, who was walking along and he became very thirsty, so he climbed down into a well, right? And he drank down there at the bottom of the well, but when he climbed out, he found a dog, right? That was uh, panting and clearly thirsty, yet kuluthara, right? So the drops of water that had spilled on the outside in the sand around the well or the dirt around the well, the dog is licking at that sand, trying to get some degree of moisture. And he said, this dog has reached the exact same point that I was at before I made it down to the well to quench my thirst. So he went down, right, and he filled up, right, his shoe and he took it in his mouth and climbed back out. And then he gave it to the dog to drink, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in appreciation for this effort, even for huh, a dog, right, forgave him. SubhanAllah. This narration, right, we don't hate animals, right, we don't hate dogs. Yeah, they have the nedges factor, right, but it doesn't mean we hate them, it doesn't mean that it's okay to abuse them, right, because even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares about dogs and people who do something nice, right, for even dogs. قَالُوا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ إِنَّ لَنَا فِي الْبَهَائِمِ أَجَرًا And they said, Messenger of Allah, we get a reward for doing well by animals. And he said, فِي كُلِّ كَبَدٍ رَطْبَةٍ أَجَرًا In every moist liver, there's an أَجَرًا. 
and anything that has a liver, if you do well by it, there's an edger. Now we all want to run out and help the dogs. <laughs> there's a lot of people that need help, right? There's a lot of people that need help. Freedom from the fire is not just freedom from eternal torture. It's freedom from permanent discomfort. It's freedom and relief and relief from mental and emotional stress and anguish. Spiritual pain and freedom from the prospect of a never-mending broken heart. Freedom from the fire means to enter into the eternal peace of heart and mind. Those are the ones who will be rewarded with the highest place in heaven, al ghurfa What's al ghurfa in Arabic? the room. What do you call your bedroom? Ghurfati. Right? The, this highest place in heaven is called the room. Is it a room? I don't know. Ma'ala a'inun ra'at. What no eye has seen. But it's an interesting name. Because of their patient constancy therein, they will be met with salutations of peace. Tahiyyatuhu. Right? Their tahiyya will be salam. Peace. Peace of heart. Peace of mind, comfort. It means that fatigue and dishonor are erased from your dictionary for the rest of time. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً وَلَا يُرْحَقُ وُجُوهَهُمْ فَتَرْقَتَرٌ وَلَا ذِلَّةٌ To those who do right is a goodly reward more than in measure. No darkness nor shame shall cover their faces. They are companions of the garden, they will abide therein forever. The husna is the Jannah, and the Ziyadah is to gaze upon the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma ja'alna minhum. It means to be cleansed and quenched by the sweetest, most wholesome waters. A'aliyahum thiyabu sundus in khudru wa istabara wa hullu asawira min fiddatin wa saqahum rabbuhum sharab and tahura. Upon them will be green garments of fine silk and heavy brocade, and they will be adorned with bracelets of silver, and their Lord will give them to drink of a wine pure and holy. It is freedom from the discomfort of illness. Ah, but the sincere and devoted servants of Allah for them is a sustenance determined fruits, delights, and they shall enjoy honor and dignity in gardens of felicity facing each other on thrones of dignity. Round will be passed to them a cup from a clear flowing fountain, crystal white, of a taste delicious to those who drink thereof. I'm sorry. Just a few more hours. Free from heaviness, nor will they suffer intoxication therefrom. And beside them will be chaste women restraining their glances with big eyes as if they were delicate items closely granted. No disappointment for the sisters either. No worries, right? It is, that's the thing about Jannah. No worries. No worries. Worry now. Write all you want, but just know and have confidence that you will not be disappointed. It is happiness without disappointment. It is ease without annoyance or insult. Other faces that day will be joyful, pleased with their efforts in the dunya, in a garden on high where they shall hear no talk of vanity, no arrogant speech, nothing of annoyance. It is complete satisfaction without pain of wanting more. Ida dakhala ahlul jannatil jannah qala yaqulu Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala Aturiduna shay'an azidakum fayaquluna alam tubayyid wujuhana when the people of Jannah enter the Jannah, Allah will say to them, Do you want me to give you something else? And they said, How can you give us anything else? Haven't you whitened our faces? Right? Haven't you entered us into the Jannah? Haven't you saved us from the fire? 
فيكشف الحجاب فما أعطى شيئا أحب إليهم and he will pull the veil from his face and there will be nothing they've been given more beloved to them than to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is the end of worry it is the dissipation of anxiousness inna Allah yaqulu li ahl al-jannati ya ahl al-jannah yaquluna labbayka wa sa'dayk naam subhanallah in the jannah Allah will come to those people and say can I give you something more again? And they say, how can you give us more than what you've already given us? He said, uh, I will release upon you my contentment and I will never ever be angry with you after this. SubhanAllah. Allah give us that contentment, Allah give us that freedom, Allah give us that relief. It's very little that we have to do, right? To fulfill the conditions, to earn it. Allah help us, right? Against our own selves, right? Are really our worst enemy. Alhamdulillah. Now, Ya Rabbi. Ahsan Allah ilaykum. Get some rest. Get ready for iftar. Make dua for me and my family when you break your fast. We'll see you all after Ramadan.